So it's lovely to see you. And I suppose we should begin because we um, do have quite a lot to share. And um, okay. I want to give you a chance to discuss things together and how you can be of support and involved in the beautiful <laughs> new community that we're creating with a monastery around us because the building is one thing, but the community is the heart of the place. So, um, yeah, I think I would like to invite Ajahn Brown to uh, lead us in a, a short guided meditation just for about 15 minutes. 15 minutes, yes. To set the mood. Excellent. Great. So, please sit comfortably. And when you're sitting comfortably, close the eyes. I just finished my afternoon meditation session. That was for the Buddhist Society of West Australia. So I'm in the mood. So first of all, just I with guess, your eyes. You can I just okay. One thing, on. the co-host, that they keep their eye out for people joining because uh, people are still joining. Okay. Okay. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. So we close the eyes and they show the co-host. And then with your eyes closed, you become aware of your body. How is it positioned right now? And I allow a few seconds for my mindfulness to become aware of my body, especially parts of my body. Because I usually sit cross-legged on the floor, when I teach meditation on Zoom, that I have to sit on a chair. And one of the things I like starting with, I, I don't have any socks, you don't need them when it's 42 degrees. But what I do do, I can feel the sensation of the carpet on the sole of my unsocked feet. And it's really interesting. It's a strange feeling of carpet on skin. And I really get into it. I let it be, focus on it, zoom in on it, everything else falls off the screen. I've got this wonderful sensation of skin feeling carpets. And that allows me to relax my feet. They start to get really at ease. Of course, I have to admit, because we just finished a meditation here in Perth, my mindfulness is already quite strong. But just being able to feel things makes it stronger. You may have socks or shoes on. Just feel what it's like, you know, having your foot inside a sock or a shoe or a slipper. What are those sensations? When you get to know them, explore them. Don't think about them because thinking gets crazy. Just know them and see how relaxed your foot, your feet can be. Now my own feet are now feeling so, so peaceful, so relaxed. And so I move my attention from my feet to my ankles. I want to relax them as much as I possibly can. That's why I call it Relax to the Max. That's not a joke or a slogan. That's a powerful teaching. When I relax my body to the max, that shows that I'm practicing kindness to this body in which I live. Like you have a home, a house, a little monastery or a room, and you make that a comfortable place for yourself. And then when it's comfortable and safe, you can allow the body and the mind to find peace. It's hard to find peace when there's so much work. So then I can feel not just my ankles, but my lower legs. I scan up my body. I usually like to go really slow. 
because I want to get to know my body, how it feels. And once I get to know how my body feels, I also, years ago, experimented. How can I make my body more relaxed? And sometimes it's just the attitude of care, of kindness to my own legs. And then I know the feelings in the legs. They start to get at ease. That particular feeling starts to get calm, like it's just been... Uh, bathed in cool water. Maybe for you, imagine that's nice, nice warm water and you're bathing your lower legs in that warm water and it feels just so relaxing, energizing even. Any aches or pains tend to disappear and your legs feel as comfortable as that of a baby. When you go past your knees, my knees don't have much pain, but I check them out nevertheless and relax them, make them stronger. And my thighs, I'm actually feeling the sensations in my thighs right now. And now they feel so at ease. But I make them feel even more at ease. It's like any tightness or tension anywhere, I try and loosen off. I always remember like the simile of guitar strings. When they are stretched and something hits them, bing, they make a loud sound. When those guitar strings are loose and something hits them, you can hardly hear a sound at all. When things are loose, they become resilient. Things can hit them and nothing happens. I, I imagine all the muscles in my legs and my butt loosening. There's hardly any tightness or tension on them at all. And then past my butt to my waist, making sure those muscles feel comfortable. And above them, the muscles in my back. So I do a little stretching now. Makes my waist and my back feel so much more comfortable. If there is any tightness anywhere, I can feel in my left shoulder there's some tightness. I think my one of my robes is just a bit squash, squashing that. I loosen it off. And that part of my shoulder releases the tightness. And it too can relax to the max. We go to the base of my torso, but I like this going up of my body, stage by stage. And relaxing as I go. And as I relax, I, I give every part of the, the body kindness. I get to my stomach, kind to it. The whole thing just starts to become at ease. Doesn't cause me any problem. Up to my lungs. I can feel my lungs. And I relax them too. There are many respiratory problems in our world today. And just knowing how my lungs feel and relaxing them kind of makes them heal up and become healthy. And from my lungs, up to my heart region, chest. I can feel all those muscles in my chest and in my heart region. And I give peace and comfort Heart, I grant you permission to be at peace, to relax, no need to get excited. I don't force my heart or my lungs. I care for them. 
when I care for them, it's like they respond, that you, you respect me. Because I respect them, they just do as much beating or pushing of air up as they need, but not too much. I get to my shoulders and relax them, down my arms, past my elbows, past my wrists to my hands. And this is something I always notice. I've been meditating for over 50 years. And sometimes I notice how my fingers are positioned and it's very, very dodgy posture which I have for my fingers. So out of kindness, I move my fingers to put them in a, a comfortable position. As I hear my fingers and the rest of the body say thank you. You actually just don't just... Uh, exploit us, you actually care for us. I go back up to my shoulders, relax them some more, up to my neck, make sure the head is well balanced on top of the neck. That's why I moved it a few moments ago. And then I go to the muscles of my face. If there's any emotion of tiredness or anxiety or fear or whatever, People can feel those muscles tense up. And I know those muscles. And I've learned from trial and error how to relax them all. So all those muscles get smooth and easy. Very, very peaceful. That's how they feel now. And lastly, I sometimes do this and often I miss it out. I imagine my brain. This is just an imagination. It kind of works for me. I imagine my brain in my skull. It's been overworking. There's too many decisions it has to make, too much work it has to plan. So I imagine there's a little hinge on the side of my skull. That allows me to open up the skull and take my brain out temporarily. Of course, this is only a, an imaginary exercise. I imagine taking my brain out, looking at it with compassion, and put it into a lovely uh, basket, which has got lovely mattresses, really soft, a beautiful little pillow, and put my brain on that mattress and pillow and put a little duvet over it and say, brain, take a rest. And if you wish to, you can just kiss it goodnight just for 10 or 15 minutes. Even your brain needs a rest. And sometimes just imagining that works. Oh my goodness, I'm going over time. Nevertheless, how do you feel? When you relax the body, you can relax the mind. Use the same thing, awareness. Learning how to relax the mind. Don't put it under any stress. Don't stretch it into the future. Don't let it be weighed down by the past. I imagine my my mind like a little feather. You let go of the past and the future, those two big heavy bags. Your brain is as light as a feather. Your mind can fly. Fly lightly up into the breeze. Hardly any weight for this time. And you are safe, you can do this, no one's going to criticize you. You're going to put your brain in your skull afterwards. No one's going to exploit you. This, you can appreciate the sense of freedom and lightness and gentleness. You don't tell your mind what to do. You just watch it swirl in the breeze, 
and just have fun. Enjoy the freedom of not being held back by duties and concerns. I've never seen a bird migrating, carrying suitcases. They just fly, free. Let your mind just fly with no backpack. Perfectly at ease, nothing holding it back. Not trying to get anywhere. Not trying to be anybody. Just like a, a feather in the wind. Okay. So now allow that feather to come back into your body. Imagine waking up your little brain in the little basket. Come on, brain, wake up. And putting it back inside your skull. The meditation has to end sometimes. And saying thank you to your body for its wonderful cooperation. Sometimes we work it hard, and now we've given it a rest. I don't know about your body, but my body and my brain is so appreciative of giving it a sense of a break for 20 minutes. And when you're ready, please open your eyes. I don't know about you, but I was very re reluctant to open my eyes. I really enjoy meditating. Good fun. Okay, so now we're supposed to do the updates uh, for you all. And while we call this a meeting, that was just a little bribe doing the meditation to get you to come. And well, actually, the meeting itself is now is like the updates, and uh, you all know. Uh, I think it's the nicest thing for Aya Chanda to mention what happened last week. So, what was the biggest event of a day or two ago, <laughs> Aya Chanda? Well, I want you to say something inspiring. But basically, the news is that um, after finding the property in November with Ajahn Brown, and he came to see it as well. Maybe that was why we wanted it, Ajahn, because going there with you, we just sat down in that room, and I felt so much peace. Yeah, it's I a good place. I don't know if it was the fact that you were there too, or the place itself, or the devas, or the whole auspiciousness of the event. Mm -hmm. But um, The devas. It basically, yeah, it can be the devas. And um, on Monday, just gone we sign the contract. So that means the exchange of contracts has happened between the solicitors. And I know it's different in every country, but in England, that means you are in. And, uh, you know, you can't really pull out. I mean, they can't pull out either without a lot yeah. of trouble. So basically, the place is in our hands. But we don't move until the end of March, which is actually not very long at all. So um, it's yeah. a very exciting time. It's basically the first time that there's been a place in England in the UK where women have the opportunity to train to full ordination if they wish and I think that's the most important point if they wish they should have a choice and now they do so it'd be lovely to hear what Ajahn Brown thinks about all of this because of course you've been yeah. behind this from the very beginning and it always meant a lot to you to have something in England as well oh yes it's not in our hands as soon as you said that, I wanted to interrupt. It's in our hearts. Your hearts are in this place. And that's uh, because it's your hearts. You know, Aya Chanda did a lot of the hard work with our committee, people like Elena, who's here, and Manori, and all the other people who 
uh, talked and uh, had a look at the place, got inspired by the place. That's why a Buddhist monastery is never belongs to one person. It belongs to each one of you. It's yours. And, you know, sometimes when I started so many monasteries in my life, I'm like a monastery, monastery builder or whatever it is. But when he first gets it, I remember people coming to the monastery in Serpentine the first time, and they said, where's the monastery? There was no buildings there. <laughs> and I said, this is the monastery. It's not buildings. It's not trees. It's the atmosphere there. It's where it came from. And all the people involved, all the people who put their hearts and their hopes into getting this place. What I'm always inspired by is not just finding a place, it's finding the place which is practical. We can actually buy it. And that's, whoa. And I don't know where all the funds come from sometimes, but sometimes you look at it and it's not enough. And then you tell people, and all these incredible, credible kind people, they just do these silly auctions, <laughs> which, you know, people pay money for stupid things. But it's not because they're buying something. It's because they're basically they want this to happen. They want to see a monastery for women in UK. It's the first time ever in history in thousands of years there's been a monastery where women can go and maybe get inspired and ordained where they can if they have children and their children say i want to be a, a nun mummy that's what i want to do in my life and you've got a place where you can send them for training to inspire you it is something i'm not sure about you but something which you always felt was a bit wrong about Theravada Buddhism for years, the lack of equity. And instead of complaining about things, you know, it's the first day of Chinese New Year over here in Perth. And it should be the first day of Chinese New Year over in UK too. And it's one of my favorite um, sayings you know, in, uh, in Chinese uh, philosophy rather light a candle than complain about darkness. And so instead of complaining about, oh, it's not fair, we do something. And something's actually been done. Yeah. You actually, I had Chanda, I was talking to her earlier, please forgive me, and she was just saying how tired and worn out she was you know, doing all of this organizing so much and sometimes it overwhelms her but then when you stand back and just see just what's been happened and what you've done is incredible each one of you have you know just given if it's not you know just donations it's time energy thank yous yes we're behind this you have made it happen a monastery is never made by one nun. It's never made by these monks like me working in the background, you know, half a world away. We support it. And each one of you should be so proud. It's happened. It's worked. We're there. But of course, there's other things which need to be done. And that's one of the reasons why we have this volunteers meeting. So please don't give up on that inspiration. If you haven't visited that place yet, go and visit. Even if it's just for the day, see what everyone has achieved. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I always said that, yeah, the house, it's nice that the house is livable and big, but it's the land which I really got um, inspired by a beautiful forest next door. It's got space. It's high up on a hill. And I need to tell you something, that holy people, holy people never live in swamps. 
They always live on top of hills. <laughs> Boar's Hill. So I'm very happy that it's actually on a hill, not in some sort of damp swamp. I must add a rider to that, though. The only uh, holy person who apparently lived in swamps was Yoda. Other than Yoda. <laughs> Every other holy person in history is living on hills and mountains and stuff. There's something about just being above the world, like out of the world. And that's a gorgeous inspiration. And even though there is lots of work still to be done, still it's inspiring work. And that inspiration of the work to be done, that's kind of, you know, why we had this meeting now. That's one of the things which I said to Ayachanda just a few days ago, that many of you have birthdays, many of you have anniversaries. It was the tradition, it still is a tradition. Even today, when somebody has a birthday, they always come to the temple. It's not what they can get, it's just what they can give, what they can do for the future you know, of their community. And they usually come to the monastery on birthdays, anniversaries, lucky days, whatever they are, or even uh, days when they're remembering their parents who passed away. I said that last night in my talk, when we talked about the importance and how you can relate as Buddhists to your parents. Some of you had difficulties with your parents. But nevertheless, many of you had wonderful parents, and maybe grandparents. And so I was taught this by Sri Lankan Buddhists, and I thank them so much for te teaching me this. Even as a monk, I don't have anything to give to other people. I can't give donations. I can arrange and a few of my <laughs> friends to cough up. And I, they want to do it sort of good things and I just have to you know tell them this is an important thing which is a wonderful thing to do in their life but it's also that uh, whenever it's my own mother's birthday or my own father's birthday in May even though he died when I was only 16 that's over 50 years ago I still remember him and I want to do something good on that day even <laughs> silly things I remember just being over in Bangkok once and uh, somebody gave me some food for my lunch that day and the food was a typical English dish. I know many of you are vegetarians, please excuse me. It was bangers and mash. And I couldn't believe this was given by a Thai family. And I looked at the date and it was my, my mum's death anniversary. And that kind of almost reduced me to tears. Why did this happen on that day? Because that was my mother's favorite food. You no know, sausage and mashed potatoes with gravy on top. So I had an extra special portion. <laughs> it's special. I told the host, this is for my mother. And you felt so beautiful. Just not doing it for yourself, but for doing it for, to, for other people who meant so much to you in your life. People who are no longer here, but mean a lot. I don't know about you, but when my mother and father died at such a long time ago, I was a stupid young man, and I always want to give. And each one of you who have ever helped me in my life, you always want to give something. So that's why I was encouraging you, and Aya Chandra was encouraging me to say this. Look, if it's you know, close to your mother's birthday or... or father's birthday or death day or someday and you want to do some really good acts in their memory that's a wonderful time to go to Anukampa take the day off work you can always take a day off and when you and that includes Ayachanda to take a day off too <laughs> make a day off yeah, things fall apart, but let them fall apart and let the people who are the volunteers step into the breach. And sometimes it's wonderful that, you know, you all have that beautiful heart. 
and you had a beautiful heart and you make sure you use that beautiful heart to help a project which in its first year will always need a lot of people going there feeding Ayachanda and I don't just mean food when you go there you feed her just because you go there she realizes that she's not left alone she's got heaps and heaps of support especially the local support I want to see the day when she does not have to organize rosters where she knows that too many people are going to come oh, even today look, we've been over here in Perth for right, so many years over 40 50 years no 40 years now and my goodness if you saw the amount of food which was put in my bowl today about three or four people couldn't eat it and I accepted that because of seeing the joy in people's hearts. They were serving. They were showing their thanks. It was Chinese New Year especially. So they're away. They were showing that they support you know, what we're doing here. And just the smiles on people's faces were more important than any quality of food. So please, when you go to Anukampa, Find out what the nuns are like and treat them. They deserve to be treated. And when you can treat them like that, and you come with big smiles. Don't always just expect to get answers to your psychological problems or emotional problems or family problems. Because my goodness, they're endless. <laughs> your job is to look after her and any other nuns there. And you find that the answers to those emotional problems or psychological problems or family problems or whatever problems, that comes from this beautiful sense of kindness and inspiration. Answers don't lie in the mouths of monks and nuns. You see the answers when you do acts of kindness and goodness. The answers actually come to you. So often that's happened. Some of the deepest questions I ever had. I went to see one of these monks, Ajahn Tate. He was a brilliant, enlightened monk living on the banks of the Mekong River. He's passed away now, but I had all these questions. Even though I was living with Ajahn Shah, still I wanted another monk to answer these questions. And I went to go and see him. Had to wait for a while for the appointment. And when I saw him, my mind went totally silent. He was such a beautiful monk, so kind, so peaceful, so inspiring. I couldn't speak. And when he, I did get something out of my mouth, it was to express the thought, the local villagers will have to drag me away with water buffaloes. I don't want to leave. He felt so peaceful, so accepted, so loved that all the questions dissolved in that matter. Buddhism has an intellectual part to it. The greatest part of the Buddha's teachings, especially meditation, is the emotional part, the sense of unconditional mindfulness and metta to yourself and all beings. And if you go to a place like uh, the Boar's Hill Monastery, I don't know, I think you said you had a name for it, but I Anu forget Kampa that. Grove. Anu Kampa Grove. But when you go there, you just suck in the energy. And that answers every question you could ever possibly have. So please go and support the place. Make sure that those two nuns are well fed. Find out what they want to eat. Look, as a monk, I know this. For years and years and years, people gave me what they thought I, I wanted to eat. And you got kind of sore tummy. I was very lucky that I was had a tough tummy. Poor old I Chanda is not that lucky. And you also have Venu Paker there. Basically, turn her on. Find out what she likes. And just give her treats. That's a way of expressing your kindness and love towards the people who teach you. <laughs> and when you go there, also just any jobs you can do. Because they also need people to organize things. Thought, My goodness, 
on what I attend, I speak to her usually once a week, and she's always not complaining, but just telling the truth of how hard it is to organize everything. And really, that's your job, the volunteers. And it's not a burden. It's an opportunity. When you really get into this, mm. you fight. You, you don't fight physically. Who's the first person who can bring the dana? Mm. Now, you did it last week. I want to do it this week. It's a privilege. I'm not just saying that. It's true. You love doing things for people as much as you possibly can, which means as volunteers, please just either organize yourself or basically Buddhism is disorganized religion. Even though they organize someone to come for the roster today, it doesn't matter. It doesn't stop you coming. And that's what happens in this monastery over here. All sorts of people come and say, I was going to come today. No, I got here first. So I'm going to feed the monks. I'm going to clean up. I'm going to do all the duties. I'm going to clean the toilets. I'm going to organize the fencing. I'm going Because when you move into a place, it's a huge amount of work. And it is not Venable Chanda's mansion. It is your place. You're going to enjoy that, enjoy that for years, for many, many times. So you get in there and you share the beautiful uh, Anukampa Grove Bikuni Monastery, the first ever in history in UK. One of these days, we're going to have to put a blue plaque on the side of that building. <laughs> you know the blue plaque, so it's a historic site. This site is the first monastery dedicated to women in the UK. And you're part of that. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Okay, I keep uh, I can keep chatting away forever. <clears throat> You're on but, an okay. inspirational wave, Ajahn. That's beautiful to hear you. Um, yeah, about the monastery. It's, it's, it's easy. It's, it's something beautiful it's easy, happened. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, I feel yeah. that. I know that. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, having been in the kind of swirl of all of this, feeling that I'm just a passenger on the journey of something that has to happen, it's been really surreal. You know, it's been really obvious that even though there are many of us involved and actually probably thousands of us worldwide who've been supporting this project, still it's bigger than that. You know, and I realize yeah. that's because it goes all the way back to the Buddha's own intention. And that is really powerful stuff. I can't say I understand how powerful that is, but the Buddha made that intention. He made a resolution after his enlightenment that he wouldn't actually attain Parinibbana until the fourfold assembly was strong. And that meant the bhikkhunis as well as <clears throat> as well as the monks and the lay women, lay men. And that umbrella was meant to include everyone, you know, gender non-binary people, transgender people. It was meant to say all beings who are human, who have this human birth and who have the potential for awakening. He wasn't going to attain Parinibbana until they were not only established in understanding the Dhamma, but they actually also realized the highest fruits. And only then... He passed away. So this was intended from the outset. And um, I just feel with the Bhikkhuni Sangha, there's something very powerful in that our direct link to our elders is actually to those elder nuns, the Bhikkhunis who lived in the Buddha's day, you know, because there has been a gap where we haven't been part of a particular cultural tradition. But in a sense, that means that our immediate elders are the Bhikkhunis of the Buddha's day, the Savaka Arahats the enlightened ones who are close to the Buddha. And you can read about them in the Terigata. You can read about them living in the forests. And that's why we chose the name Anukampa Grove, because they would meditate in Jetavana Grove or in Bamboo Grove or the Blind Men's Grove. Nowadays, they meditate at Jana Grove in Perth. And <laughs> you get Anukampa Grove in England. So um, we wanted to call it a bhikkhuni monastery as well, rather than a forest monastery or a Buddhist monastery, because that's plainly obvious in a way. Um, because this is, again, something that harks back to the Buddha's time, and it's not so bound by tradition. So the word forest monastery has been a little bit misused in some ways, you know, to indicate a particular branch of a certain lineage in Thailand. But 
any monk or nun who lives in the forest and who practices sincerely can be considered a forest monk or nun. But uh, we wanted to call it a bikuni monastery to make it very clear that this place was founded by and for the full ordination of women for bikunis and those who wish to train towards that. So um, this gives us a kind of um, assurance that it will remain in the hearts, <laughs> not in the hands of the bikuni sangha for a long, long time to come. So, um, yeah, I'm still kind of uh, blown away by everything. And for me, I'm just taking it day by day. It is a lot of work. There are many things to consider because we live as arms mendicants, you know, true to the Vinaya that the Buddha laid down for our own benefit and for your benefit too, so that we can um, be open to scrutiny from the lay people, you know, if monks or nuns don't practice well, if there's something off with their precepts, with their virtue, you don't have to feed us, right? So we only exist if you want us to, if you think that there's something valuable um, in our teachings, in our examples. And of course, that won't be a perfect example all of the time because we're training too. We're still on the path, you know, we haven't reached the goal. But um, I think this is very beautiful because it invites participation and it invites mm -hmm. a sense of us being able to learn together and grow together and be very um, open and humble about where we're at and what we struggle with. So, um, yeah, this is a wonderful opportunity to build community, which is something I think is really missing in mod in the modern world. We have a guest here now, actually, and she studied in Cambridge, Ajahn, so you'd be happy <laughs> about that. She's only young. And, um, You're not calling her the other place. No, I'm not coming of the other place, but I do keep forgetting that she's in Cambridge. It's almost like it's another world. <laughs> this is just a silly little thing between us. Yeah, of course. And Cambridge, yes. Just in joke, because Ajahn studied in Cambridge. Yeah. So he used to say, oh, it would have happened much faster in Oxford if you were in Cambridge or something. Like that. <laughs> but anyway, she lives in a community and it's uh, based around a particular ethic, I guess. They're kind of socialists and they're activists and it's very cool. Um, but very, very few people have the opportunity. And I think we really mm. suffer from a sense of uh, loneliness and a lack of belonging. You know, it keeps us limited to maybe our family or a particular group of friends. But when we have a bigger place, we have a sense of extended family in a way and extended community. So it gives us that sense of um, not being quite so strange. <laughs> there are people who can understand what you're trying to do, the way you try to live a values aligned life, as opposed to a life that's centered around material gain. And um, it's very empowering and encouraging for the practice when you feel that you belong. So I hope to develop a place that's really inclusive as far as we possibly can. And of course, it's mainly for bikinis to train precisely because we haven't had that opportunity, but it's also open to all people who want to come and participate and not only to serve and to offer food or to involve yourself in, you know, trying to organize a new fence, which we do need because our fence is actually the boundary of the monastery between the monastery and a public footpath. So we need to replace that, which is very moldy. We need to do some renovation work <clears throat> on the electrics which are about to expire, apparently. So the lights and everything work and also a new heating system. So there's quite a lot to do. And um, we want to invite you for that purpose to get involved and communicate together and develop friendships, etc., and get that joy of service so you can put it into your meditation practice. But also to come and to, um, to learn how the practice is um, in an integrated lifestyle, because in a monastery you have a morning, which is focused around serving, and then in the afternoon you have time for solitude, time for meditation. So this is a very beautiful way to develop the path. And I think something's missing, you know, when we limit our practice to going on retreat. And it can become very self-centered in a way, even in a positive way that you genuinely want to, you know, develop more peace. But still, if you're so concerned with your own um, practice and your own particular problems, you can lose that perspective that suffering and struggles, difficulties, despair, whatever it is, is a universal experience. And there has to be a universal solution. And that involves generating compassion that includes all beings you know the buddha was looking for solutions to the problem of human existence 
not just for himself, but for everybody, because what we share in common is old age, sickness and death. And the community helps us to remain um, um, aware of that and in a way sobered by that and also develop the joy that comes from knowing we're getting free of that and we're getting free from that together. So this is the aim of the place, to give people a chance to take steps towards full enlightenment and to have a lot of friendship and, and happiness and even laughter. You notice that Ajahn Ram tells jokes or things that I think are funny, even <laughs> during the guided meditation. I had to oh, giggle. Yeah. What was it that you said that made me giggle? Something like kiss your brain. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then Put I realized it's very skillful because, you know, I've been reading about neuro retraining, which is when yeah. you want to get your nervous system out of a kind of fight flight situation mm -hmm. and you want to bring some regulation to it. And one yeah. of the most powerful tools is kind of um, disrupting the the, the uh, system of fight flight with humor, with lightness, oh, yeah. with <laughs> jokes, with laughter. <laughs> And this is something that can happen in monasteries, especially when things get a little bit tense, then you can just, okay, let's just laugh about this. This is quite hilarious, really, how we wind ourselves up. So um, <laughs> hopefully it will be a place of laughter as well. And lastly, yeah. I just want to emphasize that it is a place for the Sangha. It's uh, a place for Bhikkhuni Sangha primarily, but Sangha means uh, monks and nuns. And we are having a few other uh, monastic visitors this year which is very exciting for me so Venerable Lepeka is with me for a full five months only mm. it's the time is ticking and so it's only four and a half now but um, I'm having some other guest monastics too and I think when that starts to happen you it, it's clearer to see the idea of what a Sangha is about it's not about coming to look after Venerable Chanda. It's not even about coming to look after Venerable Chanda and Venerable Upeka. It's about the Sangha that we represent. And the more diversity we can have in that, the better. Because then maybe you can see yourself in the robes. So do get involved and come and support us. <laughs> and hopefully, if you have an aspiration, you can develop your aspiration as well. And uh, there are at least two people in this Zoom room who are keen to train and at least explore the training. And it doesn't matter if you make it or not. That doesn't matter because every step you take towards that is a step of renunciation that will help you on the path. So um, this is why I'm very, very happy because I know how hard it's been to find opportunities to train and even after ordaining to find a way to stay in the robes and actually survive literally as an arms mendicant has been very, very tough. And Ajahn Brahm knows that. We've spoken about that on a weekly basis, about <laughs> how hard it is and, you know, whether it's even relevant for people to people, whether it's, you know, just too difficult to practice this way. But the commitment that that engenders is something that gives a lot of inner strength. And I do believe that if you apply your mind to something, you really, your highest aspiration and your highest values really and you don't give up on that then it always leads to spiritual growth so I want to make things easier for other people because I've had incredible support through Ajahn Brahm and other teachers as well but Ajahn Brahm's been my main Kalyanamitta probably for many lives and I just can't express my gratitude enough other than by giving other women an opportunity so this is my act of gratitude to you Ajahn and to help all Perfect. other people with the aspiration to fulfill that um oh, that calling in your heart so yeah excellent <laughs> well so done now i've actually talked too much because i'm the one that's now gone over time but um hopefully you can all already factor in an extra five minutes just in case the day yeah. goes over i would imagine no one wants it to end <laughs> mm. <laughs> Um, but anyway, now what we thought we would do is uh, put you into little groups on the Zoom and um, so that you can just meet each other and express what you think could be helpful in moving forward. Just brainstorm a little bit. You know, what do you think might be helpful? Maybe some of you have experience with organizing things or you've been to monasteries and you can kind of see maybe what's needed or what's lacking or 
ways to support mm. and maybe just share some of your own inspiration about around the project and what it means to you and in this way we can kind of draw on the ideas that are here in the group <laughs> no for those who don't know the story that that in indonesia they i was giving her a, a talk at the same time she was giving a talk and they put sort of my uh talk online or selling tickets my tickets sold out in, I think, 20 minutes. And Lady Gaga's took 40 minutes to sell. <laughs> so you're twice as popular. <laughs> That's great. Oh, well, we're back again then. And we have, it's amazing how fast these things go. I feel like we're just getting to know each other and just kind of warming up. And anyway, we had a very imaginative little uh, session. I don't know. There were other people listening in, I think. And ours was fantastical. <laughs> But uh, that's really nice. Oh, wonderful. Well, I guess um, we're almost up. And I do hope that this has been of some help or some kind of, it's going to take us forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder if we should have meetings where we really have more time to discuss and maybe something like this every mm -hmm. couple of months. I mean, at the moment, we're going to be super busy uh, moving. So, you know, there's not a lot of time for these things, but hopefully... Yeah, as we get going, we could actually have regular volunteer meetings like this maybe every couple of months and mm. and have a bit more time to really talk together. Would that sound good? Something that could be interesting for people here? Mm. Definitely regular volunteer meetings. Mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> good, good. Yes. Mm. Yes, definitely. Mm. Wonderful. And then we could have a bit more time for some mm. Dhamma as well and some heart to heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super. So I'm going to go through all your input and have a look and we're going to get in touch and increase our support networks mm. and uh, figure out mm. how to keep on developing community mm. so thank you for being here mm. and um yeah maybe we can invite shell to say a few words and then Ajahn Pram as well to say a few closing words to end we'll keep you the best till last um but if shell would like to say a few words about how else you can uh, support that would be wonderful are you there shell Thank you. I'm here. Um, firstly, I just want to say a massive, massive, massive thank you to Venerable Chanda for all of her work that she's doing for not only the Bikuni Sangha, but the lay community. Uh, it means so much. And I know you're working so hard. So <laughs> I'm just so grateful. Um, so a huge thank you from all of us um, for doing this, not just for you, not just for the Sangha, but for the Dharma. Thank you. Um, I just popped a message in the chat just to reiterate how uh, with links uh, and things that we need while I just go through this uh, uh, as I say things. Sorry, I've got very emotional. <laughs> so, um, Anuhamba Grove Bikuni Monastery wouldn't have been possible without the generosity of people on this call and the supporters of Anuhamba worldwide who have shared the merits of Dana. And now with a bigger monastery, we need your continued support as we have renovation costs and the monthly costs will be a lot higher, enabling Anukampa Grove to house more bhikkhunis and aspirants and enable lay guests to visit, to serve the Sangha and experience monastic life. So please do pop your uh, phone number and email address in the chat if you can offer any of the following. So we've been talking about the Afar group for food. So thank you, Elena, for letting us know about that. And also, if you are local and you're able to offer some regular support, be that regular support in the garden with maintenance work, driving the monastics to appointments or teachings in the station. You're also able to uh, check the calendar on our website for Food Dana to book in to join us for your birthday or a special occasion or anniversaries for extra merits. Um, and you can do this from afar. You can also organise food deliveries through apps such as Delivery and things like that too. This will really support both the Sangha and the lay community in a bigger property and especially during the move as well. You can also set up standing orders, which are going to be really helpful for our monthly running costs to support the um, payment for the bills, uh, additional uh, renovation things that we're going to need month to month. And also one-off donations uh, are very welcome. However, small or big, whatever you can offer is so greatly appreciated. Even if it's just what you think might be little, a price for coffee a month, it's genuinely so appreciated. Please also keep an eye out on the needed items list 
both in the run up to the move and once we've moved, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things that we will need when moving from um, a place that's quite big uh, in house terms, but we're moving to a very big property. So there's going to be other things that we will need to um, fill the, the monastery with useful things. Um, yeah. Um, also, do please keep in touch with Annie Camper and join the event with and teachings. Um, Venerable Chanda is offering many teachings coming up, and Venerable Upeka is joined in for all of the regular teachings too. So have a look at the website for that. Um, I hope that's okay. Thank you very much, Shell. Thank you for speaking from the heart and being emotional. That's beautiful to see that because it is an emotional thing, and we want it to move people. So thank you so much. Shell's going to be staying with me, actually. Mm -hmm. as, um, oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. For the first yeah. Few months. <laughs> and please look after Venerable Chanda. There's a lot of times she won't tell you exactly what she needs. Mm -hmm. You have to do some guesswork. Mm -hmm. And that guesswork, you can see when she's full of energy, she's healthy, and uh, you can see that. And it makes you feel very, very wonderful. You've mm -hmm. served and helped. So people behind the scenes are the ones which are most important. And don't ever think that the person up in front giving the talks is the most important. You've seen me do this simile before, the five fingers of a hand, which is the most important. You remember hearing that? The most important is not the thumb, it's not the index finger, it's not the middle finger or the love finger, it's the little finger. Mm -hmm. Little fingers are the most important. And so it's explained to me when I first heard this, because when you pay respects to Venerable Chanda, you find your little finger is the closest to her. <laughs> <laughs> so the little fingers are the best. And so each one of you, sometimes you don't realize how important you are to the success of the Anakampa Bhikkhuni project. Yeah, we have the leaders, but it's all the energy behind them. And you can't survive without the energy behind you. The fact that you get motivated by all these incredibly wonderful volunteers. I don't know the numbers, but it always seems to be more people volunteering every time we do these uh, volunteer sessions. It seems to be that the energy is building up and the energy building up, just enjoy it. And uh, in the end of your life, a lot of times I go to funeral service. What have you done in your life? And then you've been part of establishing this historical uh, first Bikuni monastery in the UK. And my goodness, that is worth celebrating. And when you pass away, all your friends, your relations, your children will be so proud of you. You've done a great thing. And it's something which just goes on and on and on. Starting it is the hardest, but over the years, the decades, the centuries, you're building something which is incredible. So well done, everybody. And I don't usually like giving strong or uh, long chants, but instead I developed the three sadhus. <laughs> Sadu. 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 <laughs> to each one of you thank you thank you do you want so to say much. the last words i agenda yeah i would like to thank you ajahn brown for your incredible immense support and practice because very often mm. people don't talk about your practice you've become a world-renowned teacher rightfully so because of your practice and it's just mm. infuses everything you do the way you guide me the way you teach others and I think you know I'm just blessed and we're all very blessed actually mm. because it's from teacher to disciple from teacher to disciple you know you're creating new teachers or new people who can serve the Dhamma mm. to others and that is passed on and that's how the wheel keeps going mm. round. So I feel very, very blessed and inspired mm. to be in touch with re real Dhamma through living examples in my life. And um, yeah, and also blessed by all of you because it's a privilege to be a bikini. We only exist through the kindness and generosity of others. So our very existence is proof of how much goodness is in the world. 
sometimes people lose hope and think there's a lot of, you know, terrible things going on, which there are, right? But even in those terrible things, you'll find people being kind to each other, people really putting others, you know, well-being highly in their mind. And yeah, for me, it's just proof every single day that I meet good people coming to serve or coming to stay, that there's more goodness in this world than anything else. So yeah, it's a privilege to be an arms mendicant and to be able to give you uh, some contact with this lifestyle and um, build community together. So thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye, Ajahn Brown. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care.